You know, Zen 2, that's the Ryzen 3000 series, is looking pretty hot and promptly stole the show at Computex this year. Video viewership is a firm testament. Those videos were getting hundreds of thousands of views and everything else seemed to not do as well. And while it's good to be back home, there's still plenty to discuss and I plan to pack much of it into this video. All right, so firstly, I'd like to touch on the chipset compatibility again. We outlined much of it in this video right here, but one thing I didn't mention was lack of original Zen support on the new X570 chipset. That means running a one series Ryzen chip with an X570 motherboard. It was clearly depicted in the chart AMD sent to us, but I didn't bother touching on it because I expected it to be a rather niche combination to begin with. Why would you upgrade your motherboard and not upgrade your CPU? But after posting my TLDR pinned comment, a few of you expressed serious disdain with this revelation and to an extent, I can understand. I mean, AMD promised us platform support through 2020, right? But I think this was meant to be taken the other way around, and a lot of you assumed it this way. Socket support for new CPUs through 2020, not motherboard support for old chips through 2020. And with a few exceptions, this is what we're seeing, right? Both X470, B450 motherboard support Zen 2 either natively or with a BIOS update, and motherboard manufacturers like Gigabyte and MSI have pledged at least a few of their higher end boards uh, will support the new chips as well. So for obvious reasons, A320 isn't included here, though I highly doubt anyone bought into that chipset expecting a future-proof platform. The power delivery on that board, or any of those A320 boards for that matter, just not gonna hold up, especially to the 12-core variant that AMD will be selling soon. But anyway, case in point, AMD promised platform or socket support through 2020, and it would only make sense to think of this in the way we just discussed, upgrading CPUs and keeping the same motherboard. It's much easier to swap CPU than to swap motherboard and you'll see real gains with a CPU swap. You'll have all the major perks by the way, you'll still have generally excellent overclocking support with uh, X4 or B4 and a more compliant XMP. What you won't have though, and what I want to confirm to you guys, because AMD directly referenced this in the meeting we had with them, is PCIe Gen 4 support on anything pre-X570. This flies in the face of many reports that vendors like Gigabyte would be activating it more or less in some other higher end products that had the trace support. And indeed, this was their, their plan. They were trying to be good guys, but AMD thinks this will be too confusing for the general consumer who might be fooled into thinking his or her board sports, you know, PCIe 4 supports it native in my opinion, this kind of sucks, and uh, the rationale is a bit flawed, right? How is this any different than SLI or Crossfire? You'll only know the board includes support for either of those if it's printed on the box or in the manual or on the accompanying website. This shouldn't be a reason to shaft motherboard manufacturers who are diligent enough to future-proof some of their higher-end products. That's that's my take. In light of everything good I think AMD's done lately, this just isn't one of them in my book. But what is good is the pricing structure. The AMD Ryzen 5 3600 comes in at a cool 199. It's 6 cores and 12 threads. And if we assume a 15% IPC improvement, as AMD claims, then we're getting just that, about a 15% bump for no change in price between generations. This isn't biblical, but it's a great leap for AMD. If current prices remain fixed for the next few months, you'll have a tough choice between the Ryzen 5 2600 at 150 US or less, which is a really good deal, and the Ryzen 5 3600 at 199. A few rumors had this chip at eight cores, which would have made it an incredible value at this price, but as is, I'd say it's just, it's just decent. The Ryzen 7 3700X is the next chip I'd like to discuss. 16 threads for just over 300 bucks is pretty awesome, especially considering how expensive Intel's 9900K has been as of late. And with IPC jumps like these, I'd say Intel better brace for impact. I don't expect these seven series chips to crush blue team offerings by any means, uh, especially with respect to gaming, but I do expect them to come awfully close. And that's good enough for me. A cheaper, equally viable alternative is all I'm looking for, and that's nice. And a bonus, at only 65 watts, this chip should stay comfortably cool while boosting to well over 4 gigahertz. All that of course is going to go out the window if you choose to manually overclock. This is an X variant, which is kind of weird for a 65 watt TDP chip, but uh, yep, yeah, you're going to consume significantly more power than 65 watts, especially when you overclock, and I expect that that power draw will be, again, slightly higher anyway. TDP is not an indication of power draw, but it's a good reference point. You're going to consume more power from the wall, it's going to pull more power from that wall uh, than the 65 watt rating, just FYI. The Ryzen 9 39 
7900X is the Monster 12 core 24 thread, 105 watt behemoth we've been waiting for, almost. It's certainly no consumer grade 16 core rumored across the web, although I expect one will come soon, but 12 cores should be plenty for the vast majority of gamers and creators in the consumer space, which begs the question, What's gonna happen to Threadripper after all this? Maybe that in a separate video. 499 seems like a pretty steep ask for 12 cores in 2019, especially with, you know, eight cores becoming extremely cheap, right? That 1700 or 1700X is like well below 200 bucks now. Granted, it's first gen Ryzen, but still that's eight cores in a consumer grade platform on the cheap. I'm uh, actually way cheaper than I ever thought those chips would get new. And uh, that's going to pose a tough choice for a lot of people looking to build their first system, especially if you want to stay on a budget, should you buy a cheaper, older eight core or a brand new six core. And yeah, 499 is a lot of money, but you won't see me complaining with regards to the 12 core variant. Why? Because consumer boards are cheap, relatively speaking. AMD assured us that these chips could run overclocked and even B450 boards. That means assuming you've picked a decent board with decent power delivery, you'll only need to spend around 600 bucks for the CPU and motherboard. Tack another 100 bucks for 16 gigs of RAM, and you've got a platform that'll surely last three or four years before its age begins to show, likely longer. On the TR4 platform, you'll spend around 350 for a 1920X, that's first gen Threadripper. It's 12 cores, 24 threads, right? But several hundred dollars on a Threadripper motherboard. This offsets the price difference between the chips alone. It means that assuming you opt for the 1920X, X, you'll be paying around the same price for a chip that performs around 15 to 20 percent worse per core and I'm just not about that game. This also ignores latency issues uh, associated with TR4 as well. And that ladies and gentlemen is my price justification for the 3900X so <laughs> there you go. I couldn't really do this at Computex because I didn't have to I didn't have enough time to just sit down and crunch all the numbers but there you go. So if we assume similar gaming performance then between like current Coffee Lake offerings and upcoming Zen 2 core for core, then what about content creators? This one's going to be largely dependent on the software suite you use for obvious reasons, but in the case of Premiere, which is rather popular, it's one I've used for a long time, you'll likely want an Intel chip still. It may sound super shilly at first, but hear me out. Ryzen's Achilles heel, and I've been saying this from the beginning with respect to content creators, has been its lack of an IGP. In hardware accelerated tasks like video encoding and scrubbing, Intel will almost certainly perform better core for core. And that's because it isn't just the cores that work in the case of mainstream Intel offerings. HD graphics help significantly, as seen in this workstation render, so it's very likely even the 9700K will outpace the 3900X in hardware accelerated video editing and rendering workloads. I'm not being paid to say that. In fact, I kind of hope that I'm proven wrong in this regard. I mean, I feel stupid even even say this uh, in a video, but neither AMD nor Intel pay my bills, and Nvidia, pff, I mean, I'm lucky to even get samples from them. And yes, you could argue that software optimization has a lot to do with this, especially in the case of Premiere. It definitely runs smoother on my Intel machines, I can attest to that firsthand, but it's the reality I confront on a daily basis, right? So in my case, I kind of have to conform. Time will tell, and again, I hope I'm wrong. I, I mean, I at least kind of hope I'm wrong, um, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that I'm not going to be. And look, to be honest, most of you could care less about an IGP, right? If you're gonna be gaming, an IGP is virtually worthless. It won't transform a gaming experience. We've got discrete cards for those kinds of things. Uh, speaking of gaming, one final thing I'd like to address is core count viability for the average gamer. We touched on this in my initial Ryzen coverage uh, at Computex this year. Anyone who purely games should avoid the 3900X. Instead, the sweet spot is looking like the 3700X. Now you might want the 3900X for something a little more than gaming, maybe just uh, streaming and gaming at the same time. Although I, I have my doubts about whether or not that is even viable uh, for a lot of you because you can get you can get so much done even streaming and gaming at the same time on an 8-core 16-thread chip. So in my opinion, the sweet spot is that 3700X. Forgo the former, save 200 USD in the process, throw it into a much better graphics card, you'll get way better frame rates in games. The difference between an RTX 2070 and a 2080 is pretty substantial, and the difference between an RX 580 and an RTX 2070 is equally so. You'll see huge gains in your frame rate compared to tiny ones you'll see between the 37 and 3900X. That's assuming you see any difference at all, clock for clock. And going off of experience with Zen and Zen Plus here, 
I mean, I think that's a fair assessment. I've touted the Ryzen 5 1600 and 2600 as the best all around value chips of 2017 and 2018. You can stream and game seamlessly and the frame rate differences between them and something like an i5 8400 usually aren't distinguishable by the human eye. We're talking maybe 80 FPS versus 85, you get the point. The 3900X is geared more toward heavy multitaskers for obvious reasons. So folks do a lot of compiling, scripting, programming, work with VMs, right? Those are the people who will truly stress 24 threads, maybe more than that, and the 3900X in some of those cases might not even be good enough for you. The games though that you'll be playing won't do that. I don't know a single game in existence that'll fully saturate 24 threads. Even 16 is a difficult task for modern AAA titles. I'm only trying to save you money here, so it just seems like the, you know, having the biggest and baddest of them all is, is such like a, it's just such a social trend now, but when you don't need that much horsepower, it is, in my opinion, just a waste of money. Spend the extra money saved on a better graphics card, and I think eight cores will do you a solid for several years. Again, at least three or four in my book. So that's that for this one. You can find a few solid articles referenced down in the video description along with our usual social media links. By the way, in the case of this giveaway right here, Zydex has randomly selected a winner. We've uh, made announcements on Twitter, but you can check who won by clicking the giveaway link down below. If you can't see it there, I'll at least link my Twitter post. You don't need a Twitter account to see who won, but if you're curious, you'll find it there. Thanks to all who entered and for watching this video. It really does help us out. Leave a like, subscribe for more, and stay tuned. This is Science Studio. Thanks for watching, and thanks for learning with us. Thank you.